We stood in the hospital hallway as the doctor whispered the diagnosis. He explained that my grandfather had an inoperable brain tumor. I fixed my gaze on the stairwell exit sign, wishing I could follow its directive and escape the conversation. I was 27 and had grown up spending many weekends with my grandparents, B and Al. They would pick up my brother, sister, and me, spoiling us with junk food, mini golf, and late night card games. As my older siblings moved on to high school football games and parties, I continued my weekends with B and Al. We shared a love of sports and cheered on the Padres and Chargers at every game we could, year after year. To say the news of my grandfather's tumor was devastating was an understatement. To hear that he had six months to live was a gut punch I couldn't brace myself for. In the weeks that followed, my family and I shifted from shock to sadness to action. We each played a role in helping B and Al. My parents talked with doctors and drove my grandparents to medical appointments. My brother stopped by for chats. My sister brought meals during her lunch hour. And I, I had a unique task. Grandma B, who did not drive, requested that I take her to the 99 cent store on Saturday mornings. When they opened at 7 a.m. <laughs> on Saturday mornings. <laughs> B and L were experts in bargain shopping. The managers of their local Vons, Ralphs, and Albertsons feared their visits. <laughs> That's because B&L knew when prices dropped, which days featured buy one, get one free deals, and all the ways to use coupons. They would proudly show me their receipts filled with deductions and re rebates any chance they could. I swear there was one time when the grocery store actually paid them. <laughs> to my grandparents, grocery shopping was a competitive sport, and in that way, they were far more successful than their beloved Padres and Chargers. <laughs> Too soon. So when B asked me to take her shopping, I knew this was an important job. I set my alarm for 6 and picked her up at 6.45. She stood ready in her kitchen, her purse hanging from her shoulder. My grandfather sat on the couch, looking deep in thought. He glanced my way, said hello, then continued to stare straight ahead. He was far from his usual jovial self. B kissed him goodbye as we headed out. My grandmother directed me to the 99 cent store, which at the time was a fairly new thing in San Diego. I had never been inside one. Being in my 20s, I barely even grocery shopped. I was not prepared for the 99 cent store. <laughs> If you haven't experienced it yourself, imagine a garage sale for grocery stores filled with dented cans, name brand knockoffs, and enough old ladies to hold a Golden Girls reunion. <laughs> B guided her grocery cart with reckless abandon. She took corners fast and tight, sometimes two-wheeling it. She bumped into other carts and steered awkwardly into an end cap adding a few more dents to a row of canned peaches and syrup. I could see why she had never got her driver's license. <laughs> I followed her around, close enough to hear her, but far enough to escape blame for her grocery cart mishaps. She examined the receipt as we left. Can you believe all of this was only $47? She exclaimed proudly. As I loaded her loot into my trunk, I wondered how necessary these items were. Four bottles of Fawn dish soap, six bottles of ketchup, three cans of the peaches she dented. <laughs> I wondered why I was here at the 99 cent store when I could be visiting my, grandma, my dying grandfather. B's expectation was that these trips would be a weekly event. I was morbidly single at the time and the 6 a.m. Saturday wake-up call put a crimp in my weekend social life. But I couldn't let my grandmother down. 
My Friday nights out ended early, despite my friend's best attempts to convince me to stay out for one more beer. The thought of navigating through the 99 cent store hungover was a fate I couldn't and wouldn't endure. <laughs> Our Saturday mornings had a similar routine. My grandmother would be waiting at the door, my grandfather sitting on the couch. I would greet and hug him, hoping for a little conversation, a little glimpse of the grandfather I knew and loved, the grandfather I was slowly losing. B would shoo me out the door, wanting to get to the store as soon as it opened, as if she would miss a deal if we arrived late. Some weeks, we brought her friend Tess with us, who was hard of hearing, but skilled at talking incessantly. <laughs> Other weeks, we brought her neighbor Shirley, who insisted I find something in the store she could buy for me as payment for driving. Believe me when I say there was nothing in that store that I needed. <laughs> Except maybe toilet paper, but I wasn't about to take my chances finding out what quality TP you get for 99 cents. <laughs> B also wanted to buy me various items. Honey, do you need white vinegar? <laughs> How about a can of baked beans? I learned quickly that it was easier to just say yes to the items she offered rather than prolong the shopping. <laughs> it was especially hard when she purchased large items for me. She must have worried that I was in constant danger of a UTI, <laughs> as every week she bought me two gallons of generic cranberry juice. Yeah. <laughs> I lived in a small one-bedroom apartment with virtually no storage. I didn't have room for a gallon of anything. As my 99 cent store purchases piled up, the car trunk became my storage in between Saturdays. Soon I had to get up even earlier just to move the items from my Honda Civic's trunk to my kitchen counter so B wouldn't see my unconsumed cranberry juice. <laughs> While I was happy to help out my grandmother, the ridiculousness of our Saturdays ate away at me. Time was passing. My grandpa Al was deteriorating. I was missing my last chances to be with him. Each week, Al grew more somber, more serious, more silent. It pained me to think how much he had changed in so little time. He could no longer play the piano, which he had done daily, religiously, his whole life. He no longer told corny jokes and puns which were the hallmarks of his sense of humor. He no longer laughed, which was a sound more melodious than his piano tunes. In so many ways, he was already gone. I wondered if that was my, why my grandmother needed to get out of the house. Perhaps it was too much to see her husband's personality change completely. On our drives to and from the 99 cent store, B never talked about my grandfather's illness. She was a master of denial, and this was something she wasn't able to face or accept. She never expressed any worries or fears, but spoke about happier times and old memories. And we always talked sports. Honey, did you see the game last Sunday? These chargers stink. <laughs> I stuck to these casual conversations. I knew she couldn't talk about my grandfather's illness, and I knew she didn't want me bringing it into our discussions. But I could take her to the 99 cent store. Shopping was my chance to give B some piece of normalcy in the life that was slipping away. One Saturday morning, a few months after Al's diagnosis, I arrived to find Grandma B's sister, Aunt Lena, standing next to B her purse on her shoulder. Aunt Lena had come from LA to spend the weekend with B and Al. Despite the fact that she was a Dodgers fan, she was best friends with my grandmother. <laughs> Aunt Lena hugged me firmly and let out a large sigh. I wondered if this would be the last time she would see my grandfather. 
As we drove to the store, B and Lena reviewed their grocery lists and strategized. As they steered their carts to the left side, I wandered aimlessly to the right. Before I could focus in on any needless items, I heard a commotion a few aisles over. Voices grew louder as I stopped to listen. The sound of metal crashing joined the cacophony. I made my way to aisle seven to find exactly what I feared. B and Lena engaged in an altercation, cart to cart, with two other golden girls. As I approached, I spotted Lena and a Betty White lookalike clutching on to the one remaining jar of pasta sauce on the shelf. They tugged on the jar, pulling it back and forth between them. B chimed in loudly, yelling, hands off, at Betty White. Betty White screamed, it's mine. I couldn't believe this was happening, all before 8 a.m. I was certain we'd be 86 from the 99 cent store. And really, would that be such a bad thing? The manager, the manager arrived just in time, and after a few minutes, during which time all the Golden Girls had cooled down a bit, a second jar of sauce was procured. Lena and Betty White reversed their carts and parted ways. As we drove home, B and Lena compared their receipts as if nothing had happened. And still, no talk of Al's health. In the weeks that followed, I made it a point to arrive to my grandparents' house even earlier on Saturdays. I sat with my grandfather and talked to him. He had little to say, but that didn't matter. I was with him. Every time I said goodbye, I would kiss him on the forehead, wondering how close I was to the time bomb in his brain. Six months after his diagnosis of having six months to live, my grandpa passed away at home. B was inconsolable. Her husband, best friend, and bargain hunting partner of 60 plus years was gone. The weeks that followed my grandfather's death were stressful and chaotic. My grandparents had no funeral plans or burial plans, which placed a great deal of burden on my parents. We spent as much time with B as possible, knowing there was nothing we could do to heal her broken heart, except to keep her company. Saturdays came and went. We did not shop. We mourned my grandfather, celebrated him, buried him, missed him. Eventually, Grandma B and I went back to the 99 cent store. She quietly drove her cart through the aisles, plucking cans and boxes from the shelves. She didn't show me the receipts as we left or comment on her savings. I unpacked her groceries in her all too quiet kitchen. As she handed me my gallon of cranberry juice, she grasped my hand and whispered, see you next Saturday. That was the incredible Kate McGovern.